Terrific. Uh, Peter, um, welcome. Thank you. This is, this is, I think, the first time we've ever met, or yeah. at least this way. This way, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've had uh, correspondence. We've uh, read each other's works. Uh, but it's the first time we've actually spoken either by pixel or, you know, in the, the usual way that people used to speak to each other. So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you so very much for taking time out. Um, I know you're busy. And for the young people here, for the students, just know that uh, one of the hallmarks of academic life is sharing your ideas and debating your ideas with uh, colleagues and with anybody, actually. And, uh, and so Peter has uh, taken up the gauntlet and he's doing that with us. Let me just say a few things about Peter. I wrote them down just because there are so many things that it would be hard to uh, remember all of it. Um, here is a um, a list of a small number of articles that he's published. I'm going to read four that came out last year. Situated counting. Technology led to more abstract causal thinking. The missing link between memory and reinforcement learning. What are natural concepts of design perspectives? The altruistic robot. Do what I want, not just what I say. So you can already uh, get an idea that uh, Peter uh, is not bound by sub subdomains. He thinks broadly and works broadly. Uh, more generally, he's interested in, and this is just a smattering of it, in um, the semantics of natural language. Uh, based uh, on conceptual spaces and time, space, number, and events across cultures and languages. You know, time, space, number, and events are uh, in the West some of the most important concepts of, among the philosophers for all sorts of reasons which I won't go into. And one which uh, uh, certainly captured my uh, imagination and my attention, the evolution of teaching. It's another area that he's been working in. And in general, he's interested in language and communication, archaeology, and writ large, very large, the cognitive sciences. So most faculty members, and now I'm going to speak again to the uh, students, most people who do work, research, library research, uh, work in a domain or work in subdomains and sometimes sub subdomains and the people who get awards and prizes are those people who have gone in deeply into a particular area. It's quite rare that there are people who look across domains. Two is a lot. Well, Peter has looked across many domains and because he's done it so well. Um, over the years, he has received many awards, prestigious awards. So uh, it's a rare mind that we're going to be hearing today, a rare academic. And it is really a great pleasure that you can speak with us about your ideas, what you're interested in these days, uh, about social robots and interactions with human beings and what all of that is conceptually and practically. So Peter, once again, thank you very, very much for taking time out to be with us. You now know a little bit about who the us is from that Van uh, had uh, played for all of us. So thank you again, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that generous uh, introduction. Uh, I'm a cognitive scientist. I have a background in both philosophy and computer science and dabble in linguistics and psychology. So, I mean, uh, cognitive science is really a crossroads of, of, uh, of sciences. And that's maybe one reason why I've been working in, in many of the neighboring uh, fields. 
Now, today's talk will be a little bit futuristic. I will speculate a bit about what kind of robots we may see around us in the future. Of course, we see all lots of robots in the industry, car making factories and other factories are full of these robots that do very monotone and, and uh, yeah, time saving uh, work. But they are, they are not very good at interacting with humans. In, in fact, they are, they are quite dangerous to, to humans. So, so I want to talk about what, what happens when you, when you start thinking about uh, 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 what kind of robots we would get to, um, to uh, interact with. And uh, I'm, I'm working at Lund University Cognitive Science. Uh, and I've done some work together with people in a robotics lab in University of Technology, Sydney, in, in, in Australia. So I'll tell you a little bit about that work. But I've also been involved in a European project on, on robots, in particular with a group in Lyon in France. So I'll tell you a little bit about that in connection as well. But let's start with what we think about robots. I mean, we are, we are kind of spoiled with pictures about robots from, from movies. And I've just collected a few pictures of, of these kinds of robots that, that we are shown in, 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 in the movies. And uh, here is even a, a woman robot. I don't really understand why a robot would need uh, breasts, but that's another, uh, another story. Uh, and of course, this is a famous movie for iRobot. And what is common to these robots that we see in the mo movies are that, uh, is that they, they are um, all look like humans. And I don't think that's a very good idea. Robots don't really look like humans, so shouldn't look like humans. But I get spoiled with this picture of, of, of what the robot is. And if you look around you, you don't see these robots. I mean, they don't exist, and they will not exist in a very long time, and probably never, because that kind of construction we see here is, is, is not a, a very good one. So what kind of robots do we see? OK, we see. Um, Household robots, and I don't have a picture of a washing machine, but that would be a household robot. Among the more modern ones, here is a lawnmower. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a machine that runs on its own and it, it cuts your grass and that's all fine. And then you have vacuum cleaners, uh, all automatic. They look like big ice hockey pucks. Uh, uh, they're not very social. They're about as social as cockroaches and they behave like cockroaches. I mean, this this vacuum cleaner hides under, under the beds and, and, and so on. Um, so uh, we don't really interact with them. You don't, you don't see anybody talking to the lawnmower or, or having fun with it. Maybe you can trick it, but that's another story. So these are the kinds of robots we are seeing at the moment that exist in our environment. There is another kind of robots coming up. And there are experiments going on with autonomous cars. And uh, they're not really on the streets yet. They are, um, um, uh, there are all kinds of legal problems putting them on the streets, but the technology is, is there. Uh, th they can run and they can, can run quite safely. <clears throat> Even if it's never perfectly safe, I, I would say that riding in an autonomous car would probably be safer than running in a, a, in a car driven by, by a, a, a human. Uh, there are some experimental things. I have here a picture of a bus, uh, autonomous bus uh, that's running a regular line in Stockholm. I'm not sure that this is the first regular line by an autonomous vehicle. It's still run on, on um, um, an experimental basis. It, it can take 11 people and it uh, runs with a speed of 15 kilometers. Not very fast, but that's for for safety constraints, it's not a technological constraint. So we are slowly getting into these kinds of robots around us. And of course that will change our lives. We don't have to buy our own cars anymore. And uh, yeah, well, in a few years, I guess, we will be surrounded by these kinds of, 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 of robots. But what I want to talk about is more robots that interact with people. I mean, a, a car in, to some extent will have to interact with people. You have to tell the car where you want to go and, and, and so on. Um, uh, but there are experimental social robots and here are some pictures. This is a Japanese robot that is, has been designed to help people with different kinds of handicaps. So it can serve a breakfast uh, 
uh, and I've watched some of the movies. It can solve some problems like pouring a cup of coffee and, and bringing out juice from the refrigerator, but it does so extremely slowly and extremely clumsily. So it's, uh, it's not like a, a, a human helper, but, but still it's, it's an autonomous thing. Here is a German uh, a hospital robot. Its, uh, its main task is to serve drinks and medicines to, to the people in the, in the hospital, mainly elderly people, elderly people. And you can see on the face of the woman here that she's bored. Uh, this robot is not very interesting. It, it maybe says something, but um, uh, it's nothing you sit down and have a, a, a talk with. Um, here is another robot that I will get back to. The, the name of it is Leonardo, and it looks like an animal. And it, can, it, it looks at you, it follows your gaze, and it does things. It's not very good at speaking, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it, I, I show it here because it's, it's designed as an animal. And maybe that's a, a better idea than having robots designed as, as humans, as, as this one up here. And then there is this uh, robot that I will also talk a bit about. This It's called an iCub. It's designed as a, as a child, a rather small child, if you look at the shape of the face. It's got hands, and it can do things with its hands. Uh, not very um, uh, diligently, but, but, but still, it can make some things. Um, and that iCub has been a platform for uh, most of the research in, in Europe on, on social robotics. So, so I'll give you some examples of, of that. And one, one thing that I will focus on here is that in these interactions, they can do perform certain certain interactions. Uh, the ICAP can even speak, and I, I show you how it speaks. Um, and uh, it, it can help humans in certain ways. But what I want to focus us on is that these robots don't know what's on our minds. That's the what you need to know in order to be a useful um, uh, social robot. So I want to talk about something that, well, I, I call it mind reading, but it's, it's, it's nothing magical. This is what we what we do all the time when we meet other people. Um, we, I, I define mind reading as the ability to understand what others feel, want, and, 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 and think. Um, and in, in philosophy, this area is called a theory of mind. You understand, you have a theory of the mind of, of, of somebody else. Psychologists call it intersubjectivity, and I think that's an ugly word, but uh, so I, I prefer the, um, the word term uh, mind reading. But my, my main problem here today, that's what I want to talk about, is how can we create a robot that has these capacities to understand what humans feel, want, and think, and use this knowledge to uh, improve its interaction uh, with, with, uh, uh, with, with humans. So uh, the, the lawnmower and the, and the um, uh, vacuum cleaner, they, they had definitely don't have any uh, capacities to, to read the minds of, of, of humans. And cars don't do it either. They have to ask the human where he or she wants to go, but that's about uh, the only mind reading that comes. I think, I might, I might be wrong there. <clears throat> So this is, this is the problem area, and, and that is essential for human interaction. We, we, we read each other's mind quite a lot uh, when, when we uh, interact, and I, I'll talk a bit about what, what we know about this. So let me start about saying something about, well, first of just, um, we have the human mind readers, we have the animal mind readers. I'll give you some examples of, of what animals can do. And then we have the robotic uh, mind readers. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of comparison between these, uh, these three kinds. But mind reading is not a unitary phenomenon. It is, consists of several components. And I will talk about each of these components. So first of all, you have understanding the emotions of others. This is what we normally talk about as empathy. We understand that somebody is sad, we understand that somebody is angry, and we adjust our own behavior uh, 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 so to make things more smoothly in, in, in our actions. And we may, be, we, we, we may feel the same thing. If somebody's happy, it's likely I become more happier. If somebody is sad, it, it, it affects me, and I become sadder, and, and so on. Then something that is we don't think about is that we understand the attention of others. We know where other people are looking, what they're in, what they're focusing on, and so on. We do this very automatically. 
And uh, I've done some work on, on in this area, how to make robots understand the attention of humans, because that's central for, for, for human interaction. So that would be one of my focus themes of others. That is what I want to do, where they are planning to go and planning to do and so on. If you want to have a robot cooperating with a human, it's important that the robot has some kind of understanding or some kind of model of of the uh, the human it is uh, inter interacting with and then uh, even more complicated and actually the most advanced form is to understand the beliefs and the knowledge of of others uh, um, and uh, and uh, if you if you're talking to somebody you're assuming that the other person knows particular things about the environment or you have common interest you have common important for how we interact with other people, how we talk to them, and, and so on. But that is something that is very difficult to build into a robot. So, and finally, uh, we have this capacity of, of understanding the minds of ourselves. I know that I'm quite a sloppy person, for instance, and I, I have to take that into account with, in my interaction with, with other per persons. I'm uh, rather impatient, uh, and uh, that's another thing I have to account for when I interact and, 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 and so on. We have this capacity to reflect on our own minds. That's a, we can call it reflexive mind reading, self-consciousness, uh, philosophers call it. So, uh, I don't really want to get into the problem of robots having self-consciousness because that's too advanced. Uh, we don't find it in other animals and I'm not hoping to find it in, in robots within the foreseeable uh, future. So let me start by taking a few, saying a few things about each of these components. So, so let's start about with, with empathy, the ability to understand the feelings of others. and. Um, uh, that has been defined as the perception of uh, emotion in another activates the same emotion in, in the receiver. So some, if somebody is sad, then the receiver, the onlooker, uh, also becomes sad and, and, and so on. And this is something that even very small babies show, the empathy. If somebody in the neighborhood is crying, the baby starts crying, and, uh, and, and if somebody is laughing, then the baby starts laughing. I mean, this is... This is like a, an infectious um, uh, phenomenon. And uh, there has been studies in, in, in animals, and we find them in all mammals, they, are, they have this uh, capacity to understand the emotions of others, and even in, in many species of birds, we, we, we find that. Uh, I, if you're interested, we can go through the discussion of how we know this, but uh, I'll save that until, until uh, later. And actually, the first person to study emotions and, and re emotional reactions in, in uh, animals was uh, Charles Darwin himself. He, he, he published a book in, in the late 19th century on the emotions, expressions of emotions in chimpanzees. He's, he's went to, he had gone to the um, uh, London Zoo and, and studied the emotional expressions of, of, of chimpanzees. So these are drawings from, from his, um, his book. And uh, there, have, there have been attempts to put, put the emotions into robots. And I show here one example and, and uh, 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 difficulties in seeing, I have difficulties in seeing exactly what kind of emotions these robot, uh, uh, this robot um, expresses here. Uh, the, this one down here looks bored and I'm not sure that's the point of it. But anyway, this is probably a surprise and, 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 and so on. But you have, you have what you can adjust here are the eyebrows, the, the eyelids and, 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 the, and the mouth. And that's um, the components that are involved in, in human and mammal um, uh, emotional expressions. Uh, but we have very flexible eyebrows and eyelids and, 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 and mouths and so on. So we can, we can vary our expressions quite a lot. It's difficult to construct robots that have these uh, capacities. And, but there have been some, some, some attempts um, here. Uh, so this is a robot developed at, at the MIT lab. And it's supposed to express emotions. I'll play a small movie for, here, for you here. And I want you to try to understand what emotions this robot exp is expressing. I have really problems here, so let's play it. Do you really think so? 
it repeats the same sentence but in different emotions. Do you really emotions. think so? Do you really think so? Mm -hmm. Do you really think so? 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 Okay, I'm not sure you could identify the emotions, but there were some uh, some differences. And here, the they use the ears. I mean, we can't use our ears to express emotions, but you know from animals, dogs, and and and, uh, and so on that the ears can be part of the emotional expression and they've used this uh, for, for this kismet um, uh, robot. But as you see, this is a problem of having a robot uh, expressing uh, emotional uh, st um, uh, st status, an emotional status. And even in the voice, I mean humans, you can hear on a human voice whether it's sad or happy or, or angry. And kismet tried to modify it or modulate its voice uh, for the different emotions, but the differences were not very strong, in, in my impression, at, uh, at least. Uh, so this is some examples of attempts to give uh, emotions to robots. Then there are, of course, other attempts to make them understand human expressions. Uh, not very successful. Uh, uh, you have to read the face and the, yeah, you can maybe analyze the tone of the voice and so on. But this is an area where, where we haven't come very far. And for human interaction, this is, of course, extremely important. So that's an area. I haven't been working in it myself, so I don't know about the latest uh, development there. But that's emotion. So, uh, and then uh, here is a robot that we built in, 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 uh, in my department, uh, with Christian Balkenis and Bea Johansson. They built the robot Epi. And it's also built like with a childlike childlike uh, head. It doesn't speak. It's um, Yeah, it can speak, but it has a movable mouth and it has hands. It can lift and gri gri grip things. But what it has is that the pupils are very, have a variable size. That, that's like a camera opening. So you can show interest by having a big pupil and you can show boredom by having a small one. And uh, the we have tested this robot with, with people coming to the lab and they interact with the robot and the robot interacts, reacts with smaller or larger pupils. And um, the, 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 the subjects who come, they don't know this, but they, can, they feel that the robot is more interested in interacting with them if they have a bit larger pupils. And this is something that comes automatic with humans. You're not aware of it, but you notice whether somebody has large pupils or not, unconsciously. And that affects your interaction with this, uh, with this human. So this is another variable that we use in, in uh, understanding the emotions of, uh, of, of others. Here is uh, the ICAB. And uh, uh, now I'll give you some examples of of uh, what it means to un for this ICAP to understand human uh, attention. So this can actually follow, uh, follow uh, yeah, uh, some conversation and so on. I'll give you an example. So for example, say that you, the human says to the robot, bring me the cup. And then if they're in the environment, there are many cups, the robot must, must uh, disambiguate by using a, a model of the attention. The robot can look at the human and see where the human is looking and, uh, and then try to find out which cup the, uh, the human wants. Uh, and, and, and or, or you, maybe the human is pointing to the cup and then the robot must understand the pointing. Or if it has some knowledge about the interests. I mean, if it if it's, uh, knows that the human wants to drink coffee, then it's, uh, if there are several kinds of cups, but only one coffee cup, then the robot will identify the, the, the coffee cup. When we have this kind of interaction with humans, if I'm pointing at, 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 at an object, uh, then um, you immediately see where I'm pointing and so on. So with this group in, in Australia, we've studied um, uh, following pointing. Okay, this is a picture of ICAB following where the movement of, of the ball here. The human holds out, out uh, the, this ball and, and the ICAB is, uh, is looking at what the human is, is looking at. So that's gaze following. 
Um, and before I get into the robotic, let me say something about the human understanding of attention. Children at six months, if you put the, uh, an infant in front of uh, its mother, then if the mother is turning the, her head, then the child follows the direction of the mother's head. So they, they can follow gaze direction by following um, the head direction. When they get a little bit older, 12 months, they can follow the gaze if it only moves her eyes, not her head. So they know then that it's the eyes that determine what the mother is focusing on, what she's interested in. Uh, so that's a more complicated thing. And I have here a picture comparing human eyes with chimpanzee eyes. And there are two differences I, I want to point out. One is the shape of the eye. The human eye is an, has an almond shape, very, quite elongated here. While the, <coughs> sorry, while the chimpanzee has a more rounded shape. We don't see my, so much of the corners of the eye here. And more importantly, the humans have a white sclera. So we can very easily see the contrast between the, between the iris and the, um, and the uh, sorry, sorry, that's uh, too quick. I wanted my cursor here, here. So we can see the contrast between the, the pupil and the, the, the white sclera. Uh, and that's something that's evolved uh, in, in humans. Chimpanzees have brown sclera. Uh, their infants actually have a, a lighter sclera. So we, we've, we've basically kept the, the whiteness of the, of the young, uh, uh, chimpanzee. But this construction of the human eye makes it possible for us to see with large precision where somebody else is looking. We can follow the gaze of a human quite precisely. And, and that's something we've had use for in our interactions. Uh, uh, yeah, or still have, uh, we still have use for it. So now how can a robot control the attention of a human? Here is the iCub and he, he is actually or she is actually meeting Angela Merkel and uh, they are uh, yeah, doing something with, with, with their hands. This is an exhibition somewhere in, in, in Germany. And, and so you can control it by, by speaking. You can say, say look, at the, um, look at my hand, you can say. Uh, you can do it by looking. I mean, this is what I've been talking about. The iCub has movable eyes or movable head. So uh, you can do a little bit of gaze following here, or you can do it by, 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 by pointing. Now, one question I've been working with, in, 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 with together with this group in, in, in um, uh, University of Technology in Sydney, is to have robots understand human pointing. And it turns out that for, for a human, this seems to be a very simple problem, but it turns out that to make a robot understand pointing is it's not uh, very, very easy. So, uh, and also we, we worked on the converse problem of, of having a human understand where a robot is pointing. And you may think this is trivial and, and I'll show you why it's not. And first of all, I want to make you aware of an ambiguity in our pointing. You can stretch your arms to go towards some object uh, and that's, uh, actually not how we point. How we point is that we look at our, our, our index finger and then we, we see where it's directed. So we, when, when we're pointing, we're actually pointing in this direction. The eye, the finger and, and here. But when somebody's looking, you're looking at the arm. So there is a little bit of ambiguity in where somebody is, is, is pointing. You have to understand that the human wants to point to this point object and not to, 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 to this one. Uh, so that's a little bit confusing. And it becomes even more uh, confusing if you're working with this kind of robot. It's called a PR2. And that was the robot we had at the time uh, at this lab in, in, in Sydney. So you have the same problem here. Now you can see that the arms are put quite low on the body of this uh, robot. It has wheels that can roll around in, in corridors and so on. And the arms are uh, quite clumsy, actually. Uh, it looks more like a gorilla than a human. So if it points with its arm, it would po point this direction. If it points with its finger, it would be, these are the eyes or the cameras of the robot, it would be this direction. But actually there is another feature of the robot that we were not aware of, but that turned out to be quite important. And that is this flat head. Uh, it's, it's got, the head has got a particular direction. So you can also think about the direction of the head. Where is that looking? 
that's like following the hair direction in the infant uh, mother uh, interaction I mentioned uh, earlier. And um, so the question is, if a human is looking at where a robot is pointing, what, what, what is the result? So we made an experiment with, this was an ex exhibition at the, in, in Sydney, uh, there were people walking around and this robot was walking around in, uh, in, in, in the exhibition hall and was drawing some quite some interest. There were also beanbag chairs here on the, on the first floor and the robot was pointing at different kinds of things and we asked ordinary subjects walking past, where is the robot pointing? And then they had to identify the object. And then we measured where, where the, where the, uh, wh how they interpreted the, the robot pointing. And it turned out that the most important was not the arm direction, nor the direction, the angle between the eye and the finger and, 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 and so on, but it was actually the head direction that determined where humans interpreted the, the, the robot pointing. So this was a bit of surprise for us, uh, but it's also important when you design a robot to be aware of how you design its shapes and so on. Because in, in most animals, when, when dogs point with their faces, uh, uh, then it's basically the head direction. We know the head direction of the dog very precisely, and, and uh, the, the, the dog doesn't use eye direction to, to guide a, a, a human. When dogs that have been trained to point, they, 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 uh, they, we, we read their face direction. So for, for that kind of interaction, the, the face or the head direction is quite important. Now, uh, we can also, of course, as I said, uh, 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 interact with robots via language. And in this group in, in um, uh, Lyon in France, we, uh, they, they, I was involved in, in helping them design a, a program that could interact with humans. And most of the work was done by a PhD student, then PhD student Anne-Laure Melier, who did uh, most of the programming. And the group was led by, by Peter Paul Domine. Uh, so I'll give you an example of how, how uh, it works here. So suppose you want to say that the ICAB gives the role to Peter. Um, so you can say it in a passive form, Peter is given the ball by the ICAB. You can say it, the ball is given to Peter by the ICAB. Uh, you can say it is given by the ICAB to him using pronouns. You can say Peter receives the ball from the robot. Um, you can say, um, uh, I, I mean, I you started with this simplest expression, I, the ICAB gives the ball to Peter. That's the simplest linguistic formulation. But as you say, see, we can, we can choose various forms here. And actually the verb here is, is quite interesting because if it's gives, then there's an, it describes an action of, of, uh, of the robot. But if you use the verb receives here, then you describe the result of, of, of the action here. That, the, that Peter is receiving the, the ball. So we can distinguish between the action and the result of, of, of an event. Uh, and, and, a, and a general rule when you, uh, when you utter a sentence is that the subject of the sentence is, expresses the focus of, it, of the attention of the speaker. This rule is not true for all languages in the world, but it's true for the Indo-European languages at, at least. Uh, so the subject of a sentence marks where the speaker wants to put the focus of attention. So by listening to what somebody is saying, you can get some information about the attention of, 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 the, of the speaker. So you can make a distinction between Peter and Myers the ICAB, then Peter is in focus, and then if you make a passive form him, the ICAB is admired by Peter, then you put the ICAB in, in, uh, in, in, in focus. And, and as I said, the choice of verb can focus on the action, what uh, the course of the event, or it can focus on the result, what, what happened. So in, in the movie I'm going to show you now, uh, we've tested this idea of, of actions and results in, in, in an interaction. And we have in, in our languages different forms of, of verbs. We have manner verbs that describe actions, like push and walk and hit, and we have result verbs that describe um, uh, what comes out of, of an action. That something moves, that something falls, that something is heated, that something, uh, that something is reached, or somebody receives something, 
they express the results of actions. And th th this is also a way of f knowing whether somebody is focusing on the result or the, ac or the ac manner is a way of knowing the attention of the person speaking. So we use this kind of language. So here is a movie. And uh, before I started, I want to tell you that Anne Laure is talking in English, but with a, with a French accent. And the ICAP has a, uh, has a program that understands spoken language, and that functions quite well. Uh, speech understanding is, um, is uh, sort of, and the ICAP has a standard program for this. So the ICAP actually understands what Anne Laure is saying, and then it responds. Some of the responses are pre-programmed, but some of them are, are, are flexible. So I'll show you the move and try to explain what happens while, while you're seeing it. And so this is Anne Laure. I want you to understand language. Yeah, 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 there is a noise in the background. Yeah. Uh, so, but you can see what, what's said here. So Anne Laure gives the robot instructions. The robot repeats to tell that it's understood the interactions. And now it performs the actions. Yeah. So now it's, it's pointing and you see it has a crooked arm when it's pointing. Looking at the crocodile and then it's pushing it to the right. This is this is asking for the actions, uh, the manner. Ask, asking for the result. The proper move to the right is the result. Uh, this was what happened. Yeah, this is the manner. Yeah, as you can see, the, the, there is a fairly fluent dialogue here. Of course, most of the phrases are, are not pre-programmed. I mean, you have to put in different things. And the, the, the um, uh, ICAB reacts to the phrasing. How did it happen? What did it happen? What happened? And so on. And if it's asked the how question, it, it tells the manner it's been done, and it, or if it's asked the what happened question, it tells the result of the action. So the form of the question actually gives an, a clue to what the human is uh, interested in. And this experiment was performed in 2015, and at the time, this was the state of the art of human uh, robot interaction. There are probably better programs now, but you can see how far we have reached. And you can also see that the robot's capacity to perform actions is very limited. Uh, the ICAB is, of course, not done to do any industrial work or anything like that. But uh, it can do some simple hand actions. And, and uh, uh, it can play some games with humans and so on. It's an experimental robot. But, but still, we learn a lot using this robot. We learn a lot about what is problematic in, in human-robot uh, uh, interaction. Another thing that is important in human interaction is what's called joint attention. And that is when we know that we are both looking at, at uh, the same thing. I see that you look at the same thing as I do, and you see that I look at the same thing. And in human children, they learn this. They are not born with it. And they learn this with, uh, within their, their first year to achieve what is called joint attention. The mom and the kid is looking at something, a toy or some other funny thing. The kid looks at, sees that the mommy is looking at the same thing. And <coughs> sorry, the mommy sees that the kid is, they're looking at the same thing. And this is very important when the child is learning language because they have to, when they're talking about something, they have to make sure that they look at the same thing. And interestingly, joint attention has not been clearly found in other animals. Some researchers say that uh, chimpanzees can achieve it, but that's uh, been debated. Uh, yeah, so anyway, humans are very good at achieving joint attention. And that's something that is very important for our, our interaction and for our language learning, for instance. 
And again, that's quite difficult to achieve in, 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 uh, in uh, robots. I mean, I've given you some indications of how you can find uh, attention in, 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 in robots and follow their gaze and how they can follow our gaze or pointing and so on. And joint attention is, is one level higher up in, in, in human robot interaction. For us, this is a trivial problem for making ro robot human interaction. It's still a, a challenge. Uh, it's not a technological problem. It's a problem of understanding how, how we interact as humans and, and transferring that to, to um, robots. And, and that generates shared experiences that we can talk about later and, and, and so on. Uh, then also, uh, we come to the next level. I mean, I've talked about emotions, I've talked about attention, now we get to intentions. And uh, understanding the intention of others. Of course, you can, you can use uh, language. The, 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 this person can say that, give me some coffee, and then the robot knows what's happening. But uh, sometimes that's not sufficient. I mean, if you're doing uh, things, you need to interact without using language. And in general, reading, reading the intention of somebody else is, um, is not um, uh, easy. I mean, I, I showed you this, uh, the movie with, with the uh, iCab, okay, it's here. Um, where, 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 the, where uh, uh, and Law was telling the robot what it should do. So the, the robot got the intentions from, from, from the human user. But in, in human interaction, we, we very often have, uh, we understand the intention of the other without linguistic uh, interactions. And, and we even have what, uh, what is called joint attention. That is, I am doing something, you see what, uh, I, I want to do something, you want to do something, and you say what I want to do, and you want to do the same thing. We want to achieve the same, um, same goal. That's, I'm, I'm sorry, I pointed the wrong thing. That's joint intention. We have, joint, I talked about joint attention earlier, but we say joint intention. So I have two examples here. This is a, maybe at a daycare center, the boys have these large bricks to, to play with, and maybe one boy starts to comes and see what's going on and he wants to help and they they help each other they have a joint goal here and they take roles in this uh, in this building uh, they don't look at each other but they have this common goal of putting yet another brick on top of the tower one boy takes the role of holding the tower so it doesn't fall and then one boy takes the role of <coughs> of putting another brick on, on on the top here and maybe this boy is supplying the the, the, the second boy with more bricks so uh, they have take different roles in achieving a common goal. Um, for human interaction, this is very important that we understand that we have a common goal, that we can take different roles in, in, in this interaction. And that's actually quite difficult to model in a, in, a, uh, uh, in a robot. And here I have another example where two girls are building a snowman. Uh, I live in Sweden and this is actually what's happening outside my door at the moment. Uh, we have just had some fresh snow and, and kids are out and building snow, snowmen. Um, and here you see that they, these girls, they really have the, the, the goal of building this, this snowman to, together. And one girl focuses on the head, the other girl focuses on building the arm here, and they don't look at each other, but they cooperate. They take different roles, they know that they have the same goal and, and they cooperate quite smoothly maybe in without talking or maybe talking about uh, something else while doing this. And if you start thinking about it, this is a very common human phenomenon that we have a common goal of cooking a meal or doing something in the fields or, or uh, whatever. And we cooperate. Uh, sometimes we give each other instructions, but mainly we know our roles. And of course, you want to have if you want to have household robots or social robots, you want to have this kind of interaction, this smooth interaction where you know the intention of the other, you know how to adjust your actions to uh, the actions of the other. And uh, you don't want to be talking and giving instructions all the time. That's, um, that's tiring. Um, okay, so that's joint intention. Finally, I'll get to joint knowledge. That is understanding the beliefs of others. And we are very good at creating a, a, what's called a common ground. 
when we are talking, I can tell you things about the person. I can tell you about what happened yesterday and you take up what I'm saying. You listen and you understand what I'm saying. You can ask questions. You come in with your comments or your fill in a, in a story and, uh, and so on. We create this common knowledge that we use as a basis for our continued um, dialogue. So we can share knowledge. And actually, we don't find anything of this in, in, in animals. Very little experiments in this, in, or, or at least no positive results. So you work together, uh, this is another kind of collaboration, on, on the background of, of shared uh, information. And you, you, you add further things, you build up a common ground uh, use during a, a dialogue. And again, I think this is a, a problem for robots that we haven't really started solving yet. So here I have no constructive answers. I just want to point out the problem of, of, of um, uh, uh, building uh, something that can create joint knowledge between a human and, and a robot. Of course, the human can tell robot things, but but still, the robot will not know what, uh, not very much about what the human knows. Uh, it's very difficult to build up what's called a knowledge base for, for, for a robot. So this remains, to a large extent, still a very uh, open question, how a robot and a human can create a, a common ground. So now I've said a little bit about, um, about uh, all of the five components of, of um, uh, mind reading about uh, empathy, attention, intention, and common beliefs. I'm sorry, there was only four components. Uh, anyway, so to sum up, I, we have tasks for a mind-reading robot. First of all, to um, develop human joint attention techniques. And, and as I've, I've talked quite a lot about how, uh, how problematic this is, how simply we do it as humans, how naturally we do it, and how difficult it is to find technical solutions for this thing. Then, and the model a flexible system for reading intentions. Some people in robotics or, or in social ro ro robotics are working on this problem, but we still have, we still have um, a long way to go here. And then model joint intentions. I mean, finding a common goal is, uh, would be a next step. And as I said, modeling joint beliefs is still way in, in the future. I talked a little bit about empathy, and I, I, they haven't really put it on the list here. But we have another problem I didn't talk about because this is definitely not my field, and that is giving a a, a robot some form of morale, uh, some form of ethics. And this is a discussion that has come up in um, in um, uh, relation to autonomous cars, because if there is a, an accident, the the car must make a very quick decision on on how to behave in order to not to hurt the, uh, the human beings, human beings in the car and the human beings on, 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 on the street. So that's a very lively debate at the moment on how to build some form of morality into a, an autonomous car. Uh, that's a vast area, but that's an area I haven't been working on. So, as I said, we don't want to have robots look, look human. It's much better if they, look like an animal or, or, or something totally artificial um, because if they look human we expect them to behave like human we, we have this expectation that they will understand our attention that they will understand our intentions and that they will know the same things as us if we have uh, something that looks like an animal like this leonardo robot then we don't expect the the animal to have these capacities so for human uh, robot interaction, I think it's better to have non human looking uh, robots. So now I've given you a survey of some of the problems that you, you find in, in developing uh, 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 robots that can socialize with humans and problems that humans will have in socializing with, with uh, robots. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Well, Peter, thank you very, very much. Um, so it was a wide ranging uh, set of ideas, including 
many, many domains and what uh, I've come to expect from reading, uh, from reading your work. I think we should open this up for questions, answers, discussion. And Meltem, uh, <clears throat> could you lead that part? And I'll say some final words when, uh, when this part is finished. Meltem? Yes, yes. Hello, uh, Nasha. My, my name is Meltem. Um, Dr. Gardenforce, it's really wonderful to have heard your talk and it was really very ins um, inspiring. So I'm sure all of us uh, or a lot of us have a lot of questions because you just touched our very heart uh, of our interest also. <laughs> it's about robotics and the interaction with humans. It's about empathy. It's about compassion and it's about, um, yeah, um, also ethical um, based approach. So thank you very much again from our side. Um, so let us start now and then the the question and answer part. I invite everybody and I have seen, we have raised hands already. One of our senior um, colleagues, she is uh, also very much into robotics, um, Gayatri Manikuti. Uh, Gayatri, madam, could you, could you just um, share your thoughts, please? Thank you. Thank you, Nandita. Uh, and thank you, uh, Peter, for the wonderful talk. It was, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we are right now working on uh, trying to design a robot, a social robot, uh, for um, trying to induce a behavior change uh, in children in terms of hand washing. So it's a it's a, like a micro experiment to see how uh, we can design agents like uh, uh, you know a social agent to do something like that. And some of the results and some of the um, uh, you know, experiment, the, the studies you presented is really very interesting. Uh, especially I found it very fascinating that when you talked about uh, pointing and attention, uh, it is more important that, you know, the, the direction or the, the, it is not the eyes which matter. It is not, uh, it is the, the direction of the head which matters, you know, not even the direction the, the robot is pointing at with the fingers. So in that context, I had some questions because we are working more with children here than with adults. Um, do you see differences um, in, in, the, in, the, in the kind of joint attention um, area or uh, uh, in empathy uh, when, when you work with children uh, rather than adults? Because uh, we see that um, there are uh, various uh, you know, interactions that need to be designed. And uh, when, when you are working with children, especially, uh, what were some of the more critical factors that really made an impression on the child, uh, which probably for an uh, adult, it could be more on the functionality or the purpose rather than you know, the interaction itself. So I would like to get some of your thoughts on, on that aspect. Um, also, the other thing was that um, all the robots that you showed had uh, the, in the embodiments of the robot, the, the face is actually an actuated face with the eyebrows and uh, with the you know, eyes actually moving and things like that. Um, in, in, the, in the initial study or the initial design that we did of our robot, uh, we did have these physical uh, eyes and uh, you know, physical movements for the, for the face, like the you know, eye cub uh, uh, robot and all that. But now we are considering um, that, I mean, or what we are reading more from the HRA research is expressiveness is a very, very important factor. Expressiveness in the voice, in the tone, um, in the facial expressions. Uh, it becomes the key critical factor uh, for engagement with children. Therefore, what we are thinking is to move away from, you know, moving with the actuated uh, faces and rather have a, a screen, um, you know, like, a, um, like the eyes and eyebrows on a screen, but, you know, the screen face itself moves. So it can have joint attention in terms of moving the face and looking, you know, where, where the children are looking or doing things like that, but rather than have that. So I, I, again, wanted your thoughts on that. What do you think about that approach and whether you think uh, uh, that is better or is it better to still go with an actuated face? 
that, that's a very, very interesting questions, question. I mean, uh, how much uh, all the robots we have seen, uh, except for the the um, lawnmowers and the um, and, and the, uh, the vacuum cleaners have had some form of facial structure. And of course, for humans, that's very, very important. We have the eyes and the mouth. I mean, these are our main tools for, 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 for interaction. <coughs> so that's our most natural tool. And we are very skillful at using them. Putting these into a robot is difficult, as, as I've, uh, I've tried to show here. Now, I don't really... I can't really tell on, on because I have to see your screen and your face and so on to tell whether it, it, it would work or, or, or not. Uh, so I, I pass on that question, but I, I want to make a comment on, on if you see a difference between children and humans in interaction. And you do, because in humans, uh, in, in, in adults, I'm sorry, I said humans and children, in adults, uh, we know when we're interacting with somebody else that even if it seems that we have a common goal, it may, may be that the other individual wants to exploit us, want to use us, want to fool us. So we are aware, we have this awareness that, okay, is this person reliable or should I cooperate or should I not trust this person? So we have this kind of second level of mind reading that I'm aware that the other person may want to uh, use my opinions and so on to, to get this benefit for him or herself without uh, me gaining anything. While children don't have that capacity, <coughs> they, don't have <coughs> they don't understand false belief toss. There is a lot of literature on, 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 on this in children. They think that everybody wants to cooperate, that everybody is, and when they play that, <coughs> that's totally automatic. And if you don't want to cooperate, the, the play breaks down and then there, there is, uh, they are not happy. Uh, so there is a difference between how, how, how children interact. Um, if you interact with a, with a robot, I mean, you should uh, presume that the robot wants to do the same things as you, that, that the robot does not want to fool you. And uh, so that would be an, an extra uh, assumption here. But for children, that comes, comes very naturally. For human, maybe not. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, and of course, humans, adults, I mean, I showed you this... Uh, hospital robot in, in Germany, the, the humans very easily get bored because the robots are not flexible enough. They are, they are really, really um, restricted to a few types of interactions. And when you played with them or interacted with them for a few minutes, they are, they are not fun anymore. Uh, while children are more tolerant and they can, uh, they can play around with, uh, with even with boring, uh, boring robots. I hope this is some part of an answer to your questions. Sure, thank you so much. <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. So we have a um, second um, raised hand uh, from uh, one of our PhD students. Devashish, could you please uh, share your thoughts? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meltem. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, mm -hmm. perfectly. Oh, great. Great. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Peter. Thank you very much. Um, it's wonderful. Uh, where my mind really got worked up is... Um, in a positive way, is when you told about um, uh, the idea of uh, purpose that, uh, you know, the purpose of purpose or the intention um, feeding into a robot. I was thinking, you know, when we call uh, something a purpose or say intention, we are basically referring to a higher goal, you know. Uh, for example, you know, sweep the floor would be a small goal. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. when you are thinking about, uh, you know, building an entire ice man, it's a, it's a larger goal. Mm -hmm. uh, or example, uh, building a city out of ice, which is even a larger goal. So that is that requires a bigger intention. So that will require a larger structure, a larger organization and work distribution, working with multiple people. And uh, which comes down to uh, building consciousness into people. Uh, into working together and all, which is basically all human qualities. I, it's um, it might be wrong, but probably there's no other species which has this quality uh, as good as humans to have it. So uh, my question is, Dr. Peter, uh, there's a lot of research going into how to build a robot which comes close to being a human. Uh, should the focus rather be on building machines or robots which are best at human interaction you know youth 
user friendly machines rather than building robots we should be targeting at building user friendly machines because to be honest robots will never be able to replace humans uh, that's what i feel i might be wrong please correct me if it is uh, so the focus is becoming largely on trying to find a human uh, in a robot where rather the focus should be on building machines which can be best used by humans and also is there a large mistrust uh, amongst humans that we don't trust each other that we have to build something <laughs> alien which satisfies our needs uh, is there a you know the building of robots has many questions into it uh, questions which are you know social political and so many other things uh, but uh, yes when you told about purpose it comes to the central point of all these questions so i thought if you would be happy to talk more on that thank you well thank you that's a, that's a lot of questions and a lot of big questions first of all i think that robots can replace humans because they've already done so in in uh, routine works i mean in lots of in industrial work putting together a car is done by uh, welding robots and um, screwing robots and so on. They do routine um, um, uh, movements and they do them very quick and fast and they don't have to take breaks, breaks they don't have to sleep and whatnot. So uh, they are, have already replaced uh, the, the, the boring and maybe laborious in industrial works. What I was thinking of was when I talked about common intentions and so on was more ordinary situation working together in a workshop in a carpentry or uh, in, in a uh, washing room or, or whatever uh, where you do your things the robot is doing uh, its things but you have to interact and you have to see what the other one is doing of course you may have uh, building something cooking a meal or or, or constructing a wooden chair or or, or, or whatever um, but then there are many sub goals and um, when reading intentions it's not just having this general goal that is important but you have to break it down to understand that now this person is going to fetch, fetch the piece of wood to make the leg of the um, chair or this person is going to the refrigerator to pick out the vegetables to make the salad and, and so on. We have during these kind of collaborative processes that, that we very often make in our everyday lives. We understand without thinking about it, what are the intentions of the other people? And if we don't understand, we make, we, we ask them, why are you doing this or what you're doing now? And you're interrupting me and so on. So it's, it's a very sophisticated interaction that we do quite smoothly not perfectly but quite smoothly and in particular if we work together for some time we know each other's habits we know each other's intentions uh, then the collaboration becomes um, uh, better and smoother now of course we can't trust each other all the time but if you're working with a person on a daily basis doing similar things then you learn to know what the, the other person wants where you can trust him or her and so on. So we learn a lot about the intentions of uh, other people. But as I said, putting this into a robot is still an immense problem. You still have to take some problems, uh, smaller uh, tasks that you can do together with a robot uh, and hopefully it, uh, it, uh, you can establish some form of interaction. But this is a huge area. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Let us continue then all together to um, our next uh, uh, colleague, uh, actually our director, Dr. Bavani. Would you kind of share your thoughts? Uh, many thoughts in my head. Uh, of course, I wanted to also share a little bit of uh, the learnings that we had from our own uh, studies in human-robot interaction. So there's one time that we had uh, uh, a group of our researchers had taken a, a, a basically a husky, uh, which is like just a, a robot that moves. It's just an, it's a ground vehicle, and they had uh, dressed it uh, in a way that it doesn't really reflect any gender. But it was what it was doing was it was carrying water for the villagers mm -hmm. from the water source to their houses, and uh, they had uh, deliberately given this robot a male voice. Um, and it would fetch the water and would deliver the water in the houses of the villagers. And at the end of the study, they had asked uh, the, 
villagers what it was very interesting that most of the people thought that the that the robot was a was, was a woman that was female in gender even though it had a completely neutral interface and it had a male voice but they automatically just assumed that the woman it was a it was a female robot because women are the ones who normally carry carry water and it's just that your perceptions of gender are so deep rooted and you would even assign a, a gender and so and so probably also a personality and that's why we would give robots names or twice names for that matter it's a it's a very human thing that we humanize uh, mm -hmm. any object that even if they it doesn't look human um, so uh, i just wanted to share that uh, that little bit of things that we kind of dabbled on the side uh, but i have a i have a question on um it's not just a question of assessing somebody's feelings is that is empathy but my understanding was en empathy is that you actually you invoke the same emotion within you right it's not just a question of assessing that you should be able to feel it so i just feel that the word empathy is a much deeper a uh, word than just assessing emotions because you can assess somebody's emotion but if you don't feel those emotions then you're not necessarily empathetic you just you're just perceptive so um that distinction between <coughs> empathy and perception is <coughs> yeah. um a little tricky and then uh, one last thought that i also had about um the the point about joint attention to join intention uh again the word intention is kind of really loaded because oftentimes even human beings don't understand what their intentions are so how then would a, a robot uh, understand intentions and 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 yes of all the questions that were asked before this this joint activity requires one a complete knowledge of the entire activity it's subdivided into many activities both parties know all the different aspects of that thing so wouldn't it be easier for us to join attention towards collaboration instead of joint intention because intention again is then a very loaded word uh, in terms of what all it involves okay thank you very much for these questions uh, the first one your example with gender is <coughs> is is very typical <coughs> i'm sorry my voice is breaking up <coughs> um we uh, we assign human properties and as you, as you say we have lots of uh, prejudices and uh, expectations about roles and so on and the water carrying example is is perfect here let me give you one more example that we've done in <coughs> in my group uh, we have <coughs> other people who don't work with robots but they work with teaching programs on computers and one method they're using is to use virtual pupils that is this the student in a class is assigned a virtual person on on the screen and and then the the, the real student is supposed to teach the virtual students uh, how to do math problems or, or whatsoever and we've done uh, uh, my my colleagues have done a lot of work on teaching math in 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 for young children and uh, you can choose your own virtual agent you can choose how it looks like and what gender it has and, and so on and then and the kids think that's fun i mean to choose your own avatar so to speak but one interesting and surprising finding was that when a child a real child picks a female a girl as his or her avatar uh, then the expectations of how this avatar will perform in learning math is different from when the the child picks a, a, a boy as the avatar if you pick a child if you pick a girl then you expect it to be worse in doing learning oh, math than if you pick a boy and that's that was a surprise oh that, my that, god that, that is scary <laughs> just... even even young children have built in this gender expectation about what who is good at math and not and i mean that's that's definitely a prejudice and if you force them to pick up uh, boys then they they, they they teach them much better and they actually learn better themselves but that's just to show how 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 strong this um, gender prejudices really are and even in young ch children so that's to fill in your your uh, your example here there are, there are lots of cases like that then your point on empathy is very good because i was sloppy there uh, there there are two kinds of empathy the one is where we actually share feelings and this is what we normally mean by empathy and then there is in, in the psychological literature it's called cognitive empathy where you understand the feeling of the other person but you don't share the feeling 
And if you're a doctor or a nurse or a therapeut, then you have to live with this, with this um, uh, cognitive empathy. You can't get into it. You can't share the feelings with all your or patients or clients because then you would break down as a person yourself. Uh, so I, I totally agree. I, I was sloppy in, 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 in making this defi definition of empathy. There are these two kinds you point out. That's perfectly uh, okay. Then your point about intention. Yeah, it's, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here revealing my philosophical background because philosophers use intention in this way and that's not the common, common way of, of using the word intention. But you pointed out that we should use, you, you suggested that we should use collaboration in, in, instead. And, and um, yes, uh, it, it's in the right direction, but on the other hand, collaboration is a complex thing and we have to break it down into, into smaller steps. And in these, each of these smaller steps, we have to, I mean, um, the, the previous speaker, the Bajist said, used the word purpose instead of intention. And maybe that's another, another uh, uh, way of, of uh, uh, formulating it. So intention for me is, is, a, is more or less a technical word. And, and when we use it in everyday, uh, in everyday life, it, it has a different meaning. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I understand what you're saying, but for me, the, it's the, to, to make it possible to collaborate. That's the, that's the point of, thank, of, thank of, you so much. of understanding, understanding this. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful yeah. answer. Thank you very much. So um, I would like to refer to the chat um, box and we have a colleague. Uh, his name is Chris. I just said in the chat Christ. So it's not Christ, it's Chris. Sorry for that. And he, he just asked, um, he thanks uh, first of all, and then uh, he had a question about um, what uh, would you think, um, Dr. Peter, is the best way to confirm, prove, assess the quality of the robot interaction. So, um, Chris, I invite you to uh, participate active in, in uh, the question and answer session. Yeah, thank you. So, I, I, I don't know if I said it clearly, but um, thank you again, Dr. Peter, for your talk. Uh, but I when I was doing um, some philosophy of mind studies in undergrad and a little bit in grad school, they always use the Turing test as the prime example of how to uh, tell if a computer has, you know, the rudimentary form of consciousness. Um, and it was always, you know, uh, as like the classic experiment and we've come so far since then, etc. cetera. Um, but then when you were, it struck me when you were talking about how we need to drop this idea of making a human robot and how that has so many assumptions that come along with it that are actually counterproductive. So I'm wondering if, if that makes the Turing test even more irrelevant or if there's some better way to test a computer's or robot's uh, so-called consciousness. Thank you. Yeah, well, the classical Turing test is that you, you converse with uh, somebody via a computer and if, if uh, you can't tell whether the one you're conversing with uh, is a computer or a human, then the computer process or the computer program passes the Turing test. So for chess, this has been passed for a, lo a long time ago, playing chess. You can't tell whether, well, you can tell because the computer is much better than a human, but that's another story. Uh, now, the Turing test presumes that you use language. That's a problem. Um, but I, I think you're perfectly right that having that as a, as a uh, test is, is not a good one. Uh, I, I don't really know how to answer the question what you should use, should use instead. Um, I mean, I mentioned that most robots are boring. You, do, you don't want to interact with them for a long time. Uh, so I, I would say that a robot that is interesting to interact with would be maybe a, a better way of formulating a, a Turing test. Somebody that has a not the same response all the time and uh, show some kind of variation in, in, uh, in interaction would be much more interesting that, than um, a, a, a robot that's, that only performs standard uh, things. I mean, if you interact with a human and, and a human says, answers with the same thing all the time, you will very soon get bored. So maybe, I mean, this is a thought that just comes from the top of my head, that how interesting you find a robot it's a better, it's a better way of judging it than than a regular Turing test. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Thank you also from my side. So I'm looking into the chat box. I could see that there's a discussion going on and um, I just would like to point to the time. We have 15 more minutes, but very actively participating in the discussion is Tour and Akshay. Um, Tour, would you kindly share your thoughts and maybe Akshay can jump in pointing to the time also so that if there is one more question that we have a chance to also um, let other colleagues come to, to speak. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Uh, uh, um, Carter Four. Uh, it's been a wonderful talk, uh, really interesting. We're all uh, kind of, have, uh, some of us have uh, some experience in the robotics area. Um, I was wondering uh, whether you are looking at uh, the robots as a tool to understand our human <coughs> capabilities and uh, description or are you aiming for a to build something that would augment our abilities in the world um in in such case um take for example a, a magician a magician has the ability to completely uh throw your attention anywhere you want you don't even know what's going on and you're very happy at the end you're astonished and you're happy and that's fantastic. You can build robots in any kind and shape. It doesn't have to be, doesn't have to have eyes. It can have a lighter that, uh, you know, uh, attracts uh, hundreds of people's uh, attention at a, at a given time. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of, I understand because we heard uh, another talk by uh, uh, Dr. Guy Hoffman, who's working on collaboration. Um, and, um, so Guy went into that uh, emotional part where how can you kind of um, influence uh, people's um, internal state by using the flow of the, of the lamp or whatever he's building and uh, how can you kind of collaborate in a sense. But in many cases, uh, it's more, I think, to understand how we behave and our internal you know, dispositions and all that. For practical reasons, wouldn't it be easier to build a robot with a hundred hands and uh, you know a hundred eyes, and uh, wherever we look, you would just go there? It doesn't look to me that he need to kind of put into him like a mind, to mind in our sense. Um, and we're seeing it in uh, natural language understanding with the representation that is far from our representation, especially with the BERT and GPT. Uh, these are, you know, um, uh, I don't know, 100 or 150 uh, uh, um, billion parameters dimension wise uh, that represent stuff that we represent obviously very, very in a much lower dimension. So I'm, I'm kind of, I don't understand why we're, or I'm not sure why we're looking that much at the, the, the embodiment or the specific mm -hmm. embodiment where we want it to look like in the sci-fi movies or whatever. I mean, we're, we're doing well with dogs. We're having a great relationship with, uh, with octopus, with, uh, with, yeah. with other animals that are completely different from us and uh, we don't suspect they have a mind or whatever. So I was wondering at a more higher level, what is the goal here? Introspecting our own mind or are we trying to mimic our own thing, which I don't understand why. Uh, thank you very much. That's a very good question. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement uh, with you. Uh, and, it's a pity I didn't know that you had listened to uh, Guy Hoffman because I love his work. And uh, have you did, did he show you his music playing uh, robot? Uh, oh yeah, uh, we've, seen, we've seen it all. We've seen it all. We've seen it all. Okay, that's good. I mean, I, I know he's fantastic in showing that you can get a lot of um, impressions of human movements by using parts of, of robots that are totally non-human, but we still interpret them as, as actions of certain kind, uh, stomping your foot or whatever. Uh, and uh, you're perfectly right that we don't have to build robots that have eyes and, and mouth and, and so on. 
uh, the problem is that if we want to have social robots, we live in worlds, we live in rooms and, and houses and environments that have been adapted to us having legs and arms and eyes and, 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 and mouths and so on. So a lot of, lot of our uh, things around us. I mean, if you work in a, in a kitchen or a, a workshop, it would be very difficult to do things there if you didn't have anything uh, you maybe don't have, need to have legs, but uh, if you want to walk upstairs or downstairs, you need some way of getting up and down the stairs. And for, for robotics, that's, uh, that's been a problem, but it's more or less solved now. And, uh, and if you want to do things in a kitchen or a workshop, you, you uh, need something like a hand that you can manipulate objects uh, and so on. So we need, we need parts that, if, you, if you're collaborating, Operating with humans, you need parts that look like humans. If you're uh, if you're building an autonomous car, maybe not. You don't need uh, very much there. Although there is a Swedish company who are building cars that that show a smile when they they come up to a pedestrian crossing, and the car smiles to show that uh, it has seen the pedestrians who are cross crossing the. Uh, crossing the uh, street uh, in, in the front of the car that comes to smile. That's a signal, a human signal. Uh, but anyway, you're, uh, uh, there are some people like Guy Hoffman have understood that we don't need to be human aid robots. And he and, he and other people are building more, more uh, animal-like. I mean, the Leonardo robot I showed you, was uh, he's been involved in, 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 in that. Uh, uh, the, the dog or fox-like uh, robot, he's been involved in constructing that. And there is a company in the USA called Boston Dynamics that's built a dog. It's called Spot that runs on four legs. It doesn't have a head, uh, but it runs on four legs and it can, it can run up hills and ordinary uh, environments. It can run up and down stairs. Sometimes it's failing and falling, but when it falls, it can raise it up, uh, stand up uh, again and so on. So it, motorically, Spot is a... Uh, is a um, uh, really impressive uh, uh, robot. And I recently uh, read that now they put an arm on, on, on Spot, and actually the arm is where the head should be, so it's in the middle of the two front legs, there, there is an arm. And there is a movie on YouTube, you can look for it after my talk, uh, the title is that Spot has got an arm or something like that. And it shows some really uh, creepy uh, uses of, 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 of this arm. Maybe somebody of you have watched this episode of Black Mirror, where they use a, a, a dog uh, for very, uh, very dark purposes that looks uh, very much like this uh, Spot dog. And when I saw Spot with the arm, I, I was reminded of this Black Mirror episode and I, yeah, made me feel quite creepy actually. Uh, so as you understand, I mean, a lot of the robotic development takes place within military military circumstances. I've avoided talking about that and I talk about uh, more about household robots and things like that. But of course, um, uh, there are other applications of robotics that uh, you maybe don't want to know about or maybe you want to know about them to be able to prevent them. But basically, your point is perfectly right. Robots don't, sh should not look like humans. Uh, that's uh, that's a, a conclusion I totally agree with you on. Thank you very much. So I'm inviting uh, our colleague Akshay to uh, join into the discussion. We have a maximum 10 more minutes, Akshay. You have the mic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nandita. Um, Professor Karan, first, this was a really some, con I mean, this conversation, I can see the chat going wild after your talk and there's like so much discussion going on there. Uh, just wanted to ask you two questions. One was uh, relating to joint intention that you were talking about. So I was wondering, when you look at joint intention between two individuals, uh, okay, let me rewind a little bit. If you talk about collaboration between two individuals, between two children, there is always um, what the child knows and what the child knows the other may or may not know. There's an understanding of the others. Mm -hmm. And when that uh, is seamless and that's well understood and when, when collaboration becomes effective. So how do you take joint intention to you know, having a knowledge of the other, and how do you build that into a robot? Now, that's that's that's, a, that's an example of what I why, what I talked about with to have a common knowledge to understand that somebody else knows that you, and in particular, understanding that somebody does not know the same as you do. And in the psychological literature, there are these tests on false beliefs. So the typical test is that 
you take a three or a four or five year old child into a room, you show the, uh, this is what's already in a British experiment, a tube of Smarties, that's a candy inside a, a, a tube. But when the experiment opens the, the candy tube, there are pencils inside. Uh, yeah, they ask the child, what do you think is in the, in the tube? And the, si the child says Smarties or candy or something. And then they open and they are surprised to see that there, there are, there are uh, pencils. And then I close the tube again and then say, now your friend is coming into the room. What will she think is in the, in the tube? And the three-year-old says that my friend will think there are pencils in the tube. So the three-year-old cannot understand that the friend does not know what, what uh, the child, him or herself, knows. But the five-year-old will say that my friend will think that there are smartest in the tube, but we know, and they are very happy to be uh, together with the experiment, knowing that there are pencils in the tube. That's surprising for the, uh, for the friend. So sometime around four years of age, the children learn to understand that other people don't know the same thing as you do. And uh, that's why we talk. I mean, we tell our, each other stories about what happened today and, and we tell, warn people, I warn my friend about somebody else who is not reliable and, and so on. We share knowledge in, <clears throat> in, in, in this way because I understand that other people don't know the same thing as I do. And <clears throat> giving and modeling this in a computational way is, is, has turned out to be very difficult. I mean, even more difficult than modeling uh, joint attentions and the people in, in, in AI and, and programming are, are still struggling with, um, with putting these capacities into robots. So we're just at the beginning of this process and I think there are a huge amount of problems to be solved before we, we get to anything like a four-year-old child. Thank you. That's good to know because uh, that's sort of the problem that I'm targeting to work on towards in my cognitive science uh, PhD. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank you, thank you for telling me that. And that's another reason for why we should have non human robots because we don't expect them to have the same knowledge as we do so we can interact with them more smoothly in that way. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. So thank you very much for the active um, participation. Again, thank you very much, um, Dr. Peter. So you answered all our questions very patiently. We are a really very diverse group with an interdisciplinary background and interests. So it was really very enlightening. Um, before I give the last word to Dr. Sid and Dr. Bavani, um, I um, really want to uh, point out that um, the area of robotics from, from our perspective. And as you said, it's really very fascinating. So it has mixed feelings and uh, it enhances excitement, skepticism, assumption, and also the request for an ethical approach. And I think um, the expression, uh, it's, it's more um, an expression uh, from Turkey. So let the mouse be a mouse and the elephant an elephant and don't treat the elephant as a mouse and the mouse as an elephant. So having this attitude also in this perspective, so let the robot be a robot and not make it uh, to a human was for me personally a good takeaway. So really thank you very much for that. And uh, I'm yeah. sorry, can I just say that I forgot to answer a question whether I, I treat uh, these studies. Not you. To, to, no, no, but some, somebody, somebody asked me the question how I, I, I look about these studies. As a cognitive scientist, I, I use this interaction with robots to better understand what we humans do, actually. I mean, we learn a lot about yes, children. Yes, 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 yes. But of course, we want to use this understanding to, as, a, as a tool for then building robots that can interact with humans in a better way. So we actually do have both goals. Uh, but we are, when we are doing these experiments with these uh, rather stupid and uh, narrow-minded robots, we understand how complicated a, a human uh, interaction is. And um, you, there are lots of lessons to learn from from these studies. So, very true, exactly. very true. Yeah. Thank you very much, very true. So now I would uh, like to um, hand over to Dr. Sid to close up the session and Dr. Bavani and requesting all scholars and colleagues, uh, if possible, to activate the video so that we have really an interaction with Dr. Peter uh, and that he can also see uh, who was sitting here. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much and uh, looking forward to further collaborations. So, uh, Peter, um, <clears throat> once again, thank you very, very much. Um, edifying, enlightening, uh, broad scope, deep, 
And what we feel in, and know is, is that behind what you're talking about is more knowledge. And behind the more knowledge is more knowledge. Uh, and so it was at really a, a wonderful level uh, for uh, the people in the group. I have two quick things, just comments, really. One is, is that there was a the theme that came through in what you were speaking about, uh, there are many things, but one that I paid attention to more than the others was <clears throat> that there's an issue of source and recipient. Who knows who passes on information? This, of course, comes from my uh, stuck in the mud bias about teaching and who is the recipient. And when you talked about passive uh, and active form of language, uh, you switch things around a little bit about that. And that uh, part of joint intention uh, has to do with uh, joint knowledge or what it is that uh, is known and not known by the people who are, or the robots that are uh, doing what they're doing. So that was just a comment, uh, not more than that. I have, I have a question which I think is uh, deeper, or at least I hope it's deeper. You know, in mathematics, mathematicians know that there are some problems that cannot be solved mathematically. And they prove it mathematically. There are certain problems that are unsolvable. And I was wondering, as you were talking about this, um, we're certainly getting, we meaning uh, human beings who work in this, are getting much better at, um, uh, at these robots, having them less clumsy, having them speed up, walking up and down stairs. In the beginning, uh, they were falling all the time. That's not the case anymore. <clears throat> so over time, what's happened is, is that with better technology and better understandings, uh, you can do this. You can uh, uh, make walking, for instance, or going up and down stairs seamless. So the question I have for you is, is, is there an in-principle reason why full communication and collaboration cannot be possible uh, in interactions between humans and robots? Or are we just simply at the beginning and we're just tinkering around, trying to figure out how it works, get better understanding about what communication is, uh, philosophical issues about intention, et cetera. All that's critical. Is okay. there any, anything that will tell us that this is absolutely something which will never be? I know that we're not mathematicians in this area, but like mathematicians who can prove that certain problems are unsolvable. That's a very deep question, and uh, I, I can't answer it, but I can comment on it. And you, you're referring to things like Gödel's proof that some things cannot be proved and so on in mathematics. Uh, there is a parallel in linguistics where Chomsky says that um, learning a grammar is Im impossible because it's too complicated. It's, uh, it's on the level of a, of a Turing machine. Uh, so uh, we have to have an innate grammar. I think it's totally wrong, but that's another story. Now. In robotics, people started with building robots based on logical reasoning. The first robots you had full of, uh, were full of axioms and inference engines and so on. You put all the information in propositional form into the robots and then they calculated and calculated and they got stuck and they never did anything because it took, 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 was too complicated to calculate all the consequences. So that is the so-called frame problem in, in, in robotics. Now then, a professor in MIT, Brooks, he said that we shouldn't do this. We should have, we should have robots like cockroaches that interact with the world directly. Directly, he says that the world is its own best model. We don't have to put the model inside the robot, but we have to have robots that interact directly with the world, and thereby we now have robots that can run up and down stairs and so on because they followed Brooks. Um, 
uh, methodology to to a uh, a, a, a large extent. Uh, and as humans, we don't know what problems we can solve and what problems we can't solve. We've been very successful in solving a lot of problems, but there are of course lots of uh, problems in our environment uh, that we uh, that we can't solve. We can't control everything. Uh, but anyway, we've become as we are because of a very long evolutionary process that have selected our hands, our eyes, our feet in, in, in a way that makes it possible for us to survive even in rather hostile uh, environments. So by having this very slow process, we have developed a body and a mind that can, can solve ordinary practical problems. This process have never had the idea of, of, of having solving all problems. Uh, uh, the evolution never, never wants to solve all problems. It just wants to have our, uh, our bodies survive to until the, um, we, we produce the next generation and maybe more individuals the next generation and so on. So uh, we are not made to solve all problems. Uh, I don't think we should make robots that can solve all problems as well. I'm happy as long as we can may have robots that help us in, in getting rid of uh, our more, most boring everyday uh, tasks and uh, uh, the most uh, physically straining everyday tasks. Uh, we already have lots of indu industrial robots that do these things. And we have, um, at least in some parts of the world, washing machines that take away a lot of work for uh, or, or the, uh, free the women from doing a lot of washing tasks and so on. And, and we, we can hope for more, more uh, help like that, so we can we can spend our 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 time more in interaction with other people, more in developing our own minds, and so on. We don't have to do all these boring physical uh, tasks. That's the uh, for me the vision with robotics, not of solving the most uh, deep uh, mathematical or linguistic problems. I hope that's a kind of answer to your to your comment. And by the way, you should have told Thank me that you invited Guy Hoffman, because then I could have referred to him in my talk. <laughs> yeah, well, it turns out that Tsur, the one who asked, what are we really doing here? Are we trying to mimic uh, human uh, abilities and knowledge, or are we trying to understand it? Tsur uh, was good friends with uh, Guy in Israel when Guy was a student. So there's also, Sora was responsible actually for bringing Guy here uh, to speak with us, just an anecdote. So look, um, Bhavani wants to say something. Let me just say once again, it was really, uh, uh, what a pleasure. And I'm happy that we now met this way. And I'm happy that all of us had an opportunity to hear what it is that you have to say. And uh, <clears throat> as actually I had mentioned, the chat was burning with uh, comments back and forth. So it was a sign that <clears throat> what you talked about and the way you talked about it uh, was uh, something that caught people's imagination. So Sorry, thank you very, time. very much for that. Sorry, I didn't have time to read the chat, but uh, maybe I can do it afterwards. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. And maybe someday uh, you'll be in India or maybe you'll want to come. And then if so, you can visit uh, Amrit University, the Amachi Labs, the Center for Women, Empowerment and Gender Equality. And then we can all sit around and talk about these issues more at length. So for the length that you gave us and your generosity, once again, I thank you very much. I would very much like to visit. I, I've been to say, India several times, but never to Kerala. So, so I, that, that's an area I would like to, uh, to visit. And, uh, and your university, of course. That would be interesting to see more in detail what you're doing there. Terrific. Okay. And Bhavani? I, I wanted to pile on the thank yous. And uh, it was a wonderful talk, very close to the work that we're doing. So it was of great interest to everybody who is there in the lab. and. Um, like I like I we kind of showed you a little bit when we started. We do a lot of work in grassroots India in the villages, uh, trying to solve, make sure that every bit of technology that we build has direct societal impact. And so that's really where our work is. And so um, very hard problems sometimes that we work with, but uh, sometimes we do a couple of fun things here and there. And we would love to see if there's any way we could do something together. Um, 
your time will be well spent. Uh, we're a very dynamic group, and so we work very actively, especially like I said in rural India. So, and yes, and we would be so happy, Sid. You told us, stole the invitation from me. But I'll invite you again. You're most welcome to join us here at Amrita. We would just so be thrilled beyond uh, to have you here and show you around, show you the work that we do um, and work with you in some way. Thank you so much for your time. Really, we appreciate it from the bottom of our hearts. Yeah, and thank you very much for an interesting discussion. And I should also say, if, if anybody's interested in um, having some literature on what the topics I've been talking, drop a, drop me a mail and I can maybe send send uh, yes. some some references. Uh, yeah. That that would be wonderful. Yes. yes, I actually had a couple of questions like that that I would, I would like. Thank you. Send thank you so much. And have a so wonderful thing on the weekend. Okay. Yeah. So Peter, or as in India, uh, people say, Dr. Peter, thank you once again. Uh, you. Really stimulating, great fun. Uh, what can be better in life than uh, academic discussions and practical implications from the academic discussions as well. So you really tweaked an awful lot as you uh, spoke about what you're interested in. So again, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh, goodbye. <clears throat> goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, Dr. Peter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, maybe, Kripa, you can send, send Dr. Peter all the uh, conversation that ha happened in the chat. You can maybe copy it and send it to him. I will. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.